OK, um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to announce that we have with us today Professor John Hattie. Um, and I guess the best way to do this is, John, if you could maybe tell us a little bit about yourself, um, that would be really nice. Thank you. Sure. Um, I live now here in Melbourne, Australia. I've retired from my University of Melbourne job. I still have a political role as the chair of the board of the Australian Institute for Teachers and School Leadership. And as my background from most of my career is in assessment and psychometrics, but I've had this hobby at looking at um, evidence from meta-analyses and hence leading to the visible learning set of work, which is trying to change the debate from what works to what works best and trying to understand and explain what the biggest factors are that make a difference to the learning lives of kids. And so it's a pleasure, Phil, talking to a learning specialist. Uh, given the title of Visible Learning, it, we tie in very nicely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'm so pleased to get you on, John. I'm a big fan and I know everyone else is as well. Um, so I think today, rather than having a presentation, it would be really nice if we have kind of, I guess, an informal chat. Like, I've got a few questions that I'd like to, to ask, um, if that's OK. And the sure. first one, it's I think it's I don't want to say an easy one, but I think it's a nice introduction. So kind of given the theme of the webinar today, I wonder if you could kind of let us all know what, what is feedback? Well, it's one of the most powerful notions we have in our business, but it's also one of the most variable. And it, it is information that we provide back to a person about their work with the aim of improving it. And that's a really key concept, because if it doesn't lead to improvement, students will sit there and say to you, I did not receive feedback, even though they might have two pages of your notes in front of you. Um, and it may, by improving you, it may ask you to stop things, start things, do something different. And it can come from a variety of sources. It's not necessarily a teacher, it can be a more expert student, another student in the class, it could be a technology, and that's probably the fastest growing form of feedback we know. And so there are lots of different ways of it. But it's that notion, Phil, of the fact that it's so variable. The same feedback I give you today works. I give you it tomorrow, it doesn't. That's the key is to understand that. And that's what I've spent in the last 10 or 20 years of my research life, trying to understand that variability. I think that's such a good point there that you just said that, you know, the last 10, 20 years of your life researching this. And it's, I think people like to come to uh, sometimes maybe simplify it and, you know, they don't necessarily understand the complexity that it that it can bring. Um, so I think as teachers, we tend to be, I think, really positive and friendly when we give feedback to students because we really want to encourage them and to make them feel good. Um, I think, you know, we can all kind of we can all think of a time when we're when we're doing that. And I've certainly been guilty of it. But I think research now is suggesting that maybe giving feedback in this way doesn't always have this great effect that we're hoping for. Um, so I was wondering if you could maybe give us some tips on how we might get that balance right. And this is a hard notion. This is a really hard notion because, Phil, you're right. Teachers are generous, positive, warm people. And there's no way that they want to negatively affect the self-esteem of the student or upset the balance of the relationship. And so we are very good at giving positive feedback. But let me give you an example. Phil, yesterday when you did the workshop on learning design, uh, I noticed the way in which you ignored three or four of your class members who were struggling and you just moved on. But I really think the way you put the effort into it, the way the whole thing worked was quite brilliant. Your PowerPoints were stunning. Your interaction was pretty impressive. You're a pretty impressive teacher. OK, Phil, I come back to you the next day. And I say, what did you recall from the feedback I gave you yesterday? And what's your answer, Phil? It's going to be I was a, I'm a fantastic teacher. Absolutely. <laughs> and that's the problem of praise. It dilutes the feedback. Um, and one of the hardest messages is that when you're giving feedback information about a task or a piece of work, don't give positive or negative praise. It just interrupts. If you give it negative, all they're going to remember is I'm a lousy person. Well, no, you're not a lousy person at all. You just did lousy work that day. So let's talk about the lousy work in a nice way. And as I said before, 
the nice way is by focusing on not only what you did, but how you can improve it. Like when we ask teachers to say, what do they understand by feedback? They say feedback is helping students know how they're going and where they're going. And when you ask students, they don't say that at all. But they say feedback helps me improve. I want to know not only where I improve, but how to improve. And I think it's a really powerful message. And one of my, our strong statements that we want to get across on feedback is not so much about our giving of it. Oh my gosh, I've made that mistake. That's why I spent 10 or 20 years on it, Phil. I've made so many mistakes in doing it. And I focused on teachers. I increased the amount of feedback they give. I looked at the nature of their feedback and all that. And it was one of those days when you have those kind of epiphanal moments that many others have had before me, and I wished I'd read wider on this. It's what the student receives. It's what they hear, understand, and action. And it's frightening how little they hear. Oh, you didn't hear me talk about the three students you missed. You focused on the, the good stuff. Then I ask you, how do you understand it? And you say, oh, I missed three students. Well, actually, let's talk more about those three students and what may have been going on. And then the third thing is, you want me to tell you, as your instructor here, Phil, okay, what can you do about it next time? You can't attend to 50 or 60 people that you're running in your workshop. So, so how do you get exit tickets? How do you use assessment to get better information? How do you pause and listen to the students' understanding? <clears throat> and that's one of our big messages about feedback is it's, it's about the receiving. But the second thing I wanted to say here is the most powerful form of feedback for a teacher is the feedback back to the teacher about what they did well, who they taught well, and how much. Too often we think feedback is something we give students. Well, yes, but much more important is the feedback we receive. And if you're open to receiving feedback, particularly when it's given without the positive or negative, the affect, and you demonstrate you improve, that has a dramatic effect on your students. Absolutely. I tell you, it's so refreshing, John, speaking to someone who is so open and honest that, you know, that, you, that they've also made mistakes along the way. I think it's, it's so nice to hear that when, you, when you're talking about that feedback for the teachers, are you talking about feedback that's coming from the students or from other teachers or both? All of that feedback to the teacher from the students, from other teachers, from the assessments, from the assignments, from the noticing. And it's the triangulation of that. Like, as a teacher, Phil, I'm pretty good at confirmation bias. I'm pretty good at asking questions, students answer them, I get them to do an activity, they do it, I end up the class, they're all very happy. But what about those students that didn't ask the questions? What about the students that didn't understand? And in many ways, my job is to look for evidence I did not succeed, and that's how I improve. Whereas so often as human beings, we look for evidence we succeed and ignore. And, the, and going back to what we said before, like you don't come into a class to learn that which you don't, which you already know. Um, Graham Nuttall showed 40 to 50 percent of every class, all the kids know the stuff already. It's too easy. It's what you don't know. And sometimes we're terrified to tell people and talk to them about what they don't know. But like my eldest grandchild, she's now six. She's already learning that if she doesn't know, look like she does and hope she doesn't get picked on. Well, that's the antithesis. Like failure is the learner's best friend. Errors and struggle are desirable words. Feedback loves errors. If you get 100% all the time, Phil, not much telling you, point telling you how to improve. I just keep doing what you're doing, which isn't very helpful feedback at all. So how do I construct tasks that maximize the feedback opportunities? It's kind of the 70 to 80 percent rule. The 70 to 80 percent chance of you doing it, 20 to 30 percent chance you can't, and that's where the feedback's optimized. But go back to what you said before, Phil. We're nice people. We like to give kids things that they don't struggle with, that they don't fail with, that they get right, that they can do. We're not serving them at all. I think that's so true, and I love it when you kind of you bring it talking about your grandkids as well. I love to kind of give examples with my kids and stuff how you know I'll speak to my children and I'll ask them something and uh, my eldest is six and he's so good at faking it you know he'll be like oh yeah I completely understand that and, and then I'll say okay well tell me what I've just asked you to do and <laughs> you just think yeah okay and then you kind of and then he looks and yeah it's you, know, you get to you wait till they get to teenagers they're brilliant at selective listening yeah I've been 
married 38 years and one of the reasons for success is I'm the world's best selective listener. And that can be a massive impediment. But the thing is, like, take your six-year-old. Is he or she? That is a boy, Jacob, yeah. Boy. He, he is probably a set obsessed about why questions. But unfortunately, by the time he gets to eight, he'll learn that it's all about what questions. And that curiosity goes. So your job, father, is to keep focusing on those why questions. It's the what they don't know. It's the curiosity, which is about what you don't know. And I just worry at schools that we get so focused on facts and knowledge that we forget that it is about curiosity. Now, I want both. I want both. But your job, well, we're just, I've just written a book with my son on uh, visible learning for parents. And we argue that parents are not first teachers because that mixes up the role. You're first learners. And you never learn, lose the role of being a learner and demonstrating to your kid that I'm going to take on st difficult tasks and I'm going to fail. And it's OK. And I look at what happened during COVID. Many parents, even though they all went to school themselves and some of them very successfully, forgot that it's not getting it right. And when they complain to the teachers about, oh, the kid doesn't understand what they have to do. They're not motivated to do it. They're confused. Do you think? Perfect. Yeah. And I, th I think yeah, I've heard you say this so many times, and I think it's so true that, you know, it's OK not to know. And I think letting your students know that I think as early on as possible and can like continuing to let them know is so important like how many times the people ask questions and I've heard you say so many times that you know the students that put their hands up are the ones that know the answers the ones that don't know are the ones that don't put their hands up and I think that was that was such a good the thing point to remember. Here today fellas this is the feedback cauldron that really makes the difference is when you have that kind of climate in your classroom so it's no surprising that feedback's variable and in classes where it's all about the facts. It's all about the knowledge. You privilege kids to put their hand up. Feedback isn't that powerful. And here's a conspiracy. Kids above average prefer teachers to talk and teachers to ask questions about the facts because that's the game they're brilliant at. But we're not serving them well at all. Like, why is it most gifted kids don't become gifted adults? Less than 2% of child prodigies become gifted adults. They've forgotten what it's like to fail. They've forgotten what it's like to be challenged particularly in areas where they don't have the content domain. And that's really, really sad. So, but let me, let me assure you though, what keeps me going when I come to your country and all other countries, I see so much excellence out there. And so you really can see classrooms that are feedback rich, that are student question rich. Like one of my simple things I do when I walk in a classroom is I count the student questions. On average, kids ask questions about their work, they don't know the answer to, a class asks about two or three a day. A teacher asks 150 questions a day that re require less than three word answers. Count the student questions. It's a mammothly powerful notion. Yeah, that's great. Um, so another question I have, um, kind of given that we've moved a lot more online, certainly over the past two years, would you say that there's a difference in the way that we should give face-to-face -face feedback compared with how we should maybe give feedback online? Before COVID happened, one of my PhD students, Marie Davis, was looking at ways to increase the amount of student questions in class and therefore increase the amount of feedback sought. And we, she did a number of studies and I, I was actually there the day when the epiphanal moment happened. And she, this, this class of 14 year olds, and there's the 14 year old boy in the class, like he was a nice kid, he fitted in, sporty, kids liked him. You can imagine the kind of kid he was. He was clearly struggling. And she could see it. So she went up to him and said, tell me what you think. He said, no, I'm all right, miss. And she persisted. And so did he. I'm OK. No, OK. And he clearly wasn't. And then she looked over his shoulder. And there he was using kind of like Facebook, but without the downsides. It was, it was an app called Ed Moto. He was typing in the question that he wasn't prepared to ask her in person, but he was prepared to divulge to all his fellow students and his teacher using social media. That opened up a whole area. And one of the things about COVID, which was fascinating, is using social media apps, kids are more likely to talk about what they don't know. They're more likely to ask questions. And I think that that is the biggest power of technology that's untapped. And when I hear schools banning social media, and we know technology, as Dylan Williams has said, has been the revolution coming for 50 years, because we've seen it as a technology. We haven't used 
the social so the social media side of it i think is really really powerful like another app that we use called verso where the kids at the end of the lesson they type in or they pick what their emotion is now we have about a hundred thousand kids who have used this 60 percent of their emotions are positive 40 percent of them are negative and the dominant one by a million miles if you did a word of it's the, almost the whole world is boredom but here's the fascination the other part of the app is the kids can tick a box to say, I want to talk to the teacher about my feelings today. One in five. And every teacher I know has talked to those kids. So let me ask your viewers. Do you know the 20% of the kids that want to talk to you about their emotion? Because they're in your class. And if you don't know, you're blind to what's going on. I think this use of social media is a powerful, powerful way to in indulge in feedback, get feedback to you as the teacher. So yeah, I think, I think we saw that in COVID. Like, in COVID distance learning, you could not stand up to a group of kids and talk to them for 90% of the time, ask 150 questions requiring three word answers. It couldn't happen. You had to give up responsibility. You had to teach kids how to be learners. You had to teach kids how to work with each other. Here's the biggest travesty, Phil. We're rushing back to the old normal so fast and the biggest travesty of COVID is we're not learning anything from it. Take, tell me, what did you do in COVID? Did you keep doing what you're doing before or how did you use social media? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's scary, isn't it? It's um I've always kind of been thinking there's there's no way that things will go back. And yeah, it's maybe things are starting to slip back. So I think kind of these alarm bells going off, I think they're they are important moments that people kind of need to sit up and think, hang on a second. Um you're you're absolutely right. And I, I think kind of hit the nail on the head there when you know you were saying about students that were applying you know with with boredom and things like that and I think sometimes maybe teachers take that as feedback but in maybe the wrong way as well because they see that as like a personal attack on their character and it's it's not the case is it it's just that you know we well, maybe I'm need sorry it is Phil okay it is but here's the good news at least unlike things like anxiety and depression etc we can do something about boredom. We can increase the amount of challenge. We can understand how what kids' challenges. Like kids walk into every room with an incredible amount of motivational resources. They just don't want to spend it on some of the stuff we teach them. And us not knowing and us being blind and just keeping going is serving no kid well. Now, I take the opposite argument. I think it is an attack on what you're doing, and we should listen to it. And I'm, as I say before, I, what I see is teachers who know this, they fix it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's something. Mean, yeah, it's, it's it's certainly a good way to look at it. It's um, it gives you a mechanism to kind of to initiate change. Absolutely. Yeah. Phil, you're the only person in the room paid to be there. You're the only person th there to be paid to improve. I make no apologies. Yes, and I see teachers constantly on the lookout. Like one of the attributes of great teachers is they're incredibly nosy, and they're looking for this all the time. The teachers who are not so good. They sit back and wait for it to come to them. Well, they're brilliant at selecting out what comes to them. I'm sorry, it's not good enough. Yeah, no, no, it's, a, it's such a good point. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah very good. Um, I think we've probably got time for maybe maybe one question to go now, um, just to kind of fit into the time we've got. Um, I know that you've talked a lot about kind of how in the past we have we've asked that question, what works? And, um, you know, we're always looking for that, you know, that magic pill and things like that, um, or that magic kind of thing that's going to fix everything. And I know that you've kind of, you've thrown that on his head and said, you know, we need to be thinking about, you know, because everything, you know, everything has an impact, as you've said. And you've said that, you know, instead we need to be looking at what works best. I was just wondering if you kind of, I know you've got lots of thoughts on that, but if you kind of could maybe summarise and if you had any kind of, any tips or something that you could maybe give everyone on something that that does work best that would be really nice yeah like i think we spend far too much debate and time about teaching i'm a great fan of um the singapore philosophy Let, let's teach less learn more um let's change the focus of the discussion about how students learn um the more we talk about teaching the more we're talking about us the more we talk about learning, the more we talk about them. And it's about them, not us. Of course, teaching matters, but learning is what matters up front. But the key issue here is 
it's not what teachers do. And we always look for that magic, what do we do? It's how we think about what we do. And the, the essence of that is this notion of evaluative thinking, is how we make value statements about what we do, what the impact has. And you know my cliche, know thy impact, constantly looking for impact. So what my biggest tip is pause many times in a class and ask, how am I going? Now, it'll take a while to get the students to give you the feedback because they've been 10, 15, 20 years knowing that teachers never ask that question. Um, seek the feedback from the students. Like, when I saw your assignment the other day, I realized you couldn't do this. Obviously, I didn't teach that well enough. What can we do together to do it? Take some responsibility. Ask that res constant question. How am I going? How am I going? How am I going? And if you do that as a teacher, that, that will help you make decisions. Like, we take the strong argument, there isn't one right way of teaching. And yes, there are some teaching methods that have a much higher probability of teaching than others, but here's the problem. At the right time, when you're teaching content, the ones that have better effects are different from the ones when you're teaching deep. And I want both, which means you as a teacher have to have multiple methods. Here's a question no one's ever answered that I can find. When is the right moment to switch from the focus on content to the focus on relationship between contents. There's an easy way. Ask the students, how are you going? Do you understand this? Are you ready? Have you got sufficient understanding to now move over here? And if you're over here and you don't understand, let's go back and learn some content to come back. I think that it's this constant statement, and my biggest tip would be ask, how am I going all the time? How am I going? And create a climate where the students give you that feedback without the negative feedback. Like, even the worst teachers in the world, kids can be kind to. And ignore and say, oh, well, she's just OK. Well, the kids aren't as nasty as we think they are if you set up the right climate. So there's my tip. How are you going? Fantastic. And it's, you know, it's I think it's one of those things that you think, well, yeah, of course. But so many people forget to do that. And I think I've been guilty of that as well. When I've kind of taught materials in the past, you get so focused on kind of what you're trying to get across that you forget sometimes to 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 build in those pauses and to make to make you know make the effort to to ask and and don't be scared sometimes that that might mean that you have to deviate from your your plan at the start but if the students don't get that content then there's no point going on to that kind of bit that you've planned because you're just going to lose them and yeah it's John it's so true um I'm so pleased we've got you on I really am I could, I could talk to you all day John um I really could but yeah I think we'll, we'll have to We'll have to stop there. And I know you kind of, you know, it's it's late where you are and, you, you know, you need your dinner. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much, Phil. Thanks to the listeners and happy to follow up with any questions and answers if they want to get them to you. We'll follow that up. Thank you so much, John. And it's, yeah, it's a real, real, real pleasure for me to to finally meet you. So thank you so much.